Hello, everyone. Um, before I dive in, I will tell you a couple of things that suck about doing an event like this. The first one can be that I can almost guarantee that I will come down with a cough just before the event happens. So do excuse me if I get some water and or collapse in a coughing fit during the course of this. Um, the second thing would be always liaise with the organisers to make sure that you're not put up on stage after three excellent, articulate, charismatic, content-filled presentations, because it sets a really high bar and it makes you more nervous. <laughs> and the final and most important thing would be, don't be the presenter that stands between a technical audience and their lunch. <laughs> so, I apologise for that. I will try to rattle through. Um, I was tempted to say a technical presentation on the subject of federated roaming today and on reflection I've been in management too long to ever even try that this will not be a technical talk it will be more of the principles involved I think I left one swim lane diagram in there just to stop a pitch invasion but um, I won't really address it um, I'll say a little bit about JISC because we, I mean, I take this as, as an industry day, and I'm assuming the audience here is suppliers, integrators, troubleshooters, I understand. Um, JISC really is kind of the peanut gallery to one side telling your customers, why don't you do it this way? It'll be better. You'll get more out of what you do. Put this in your procurement documentation and, and get all these suppliers to respond and address the agenda that we're trying to persuade you to set. Um, so JISC is really the um, networking charity that supports uh, UK research and education. Um, we've got lots of fibre, big networks, busiest NREN in Europe, apparently, from the club of NRENs. NREN here is National Research and Education Network. So, so we join the universities together, basically, and colleges and schools and cultural institutions and hairdressing institutes. Um, one of the numbers here is fun. Uh, we are carrying one exabyte a year at the moment, if you add together the capacities of all these links on the map there. That was the global internet capacity in 2012. So UK education at the moment and things that we connect up, like um, particle accelerators and radio telescopes, are generating a globe's worth of traffic these days. But that's enough about JISC. Let's talk about visitors to your network. And really, what you want to know about people who visit your network. And I think it's quite a short list, quite a common sense list. Um, who is this person that, that rocks up and says, please let me onto your network and let me launch unknown traffic across it? Where have they come from? Is it an organisation you've actually heard of and are working with? Were they sacked last week for IT misdemeanours and have just come down the road to someone who will accept them as a guest with a bit of social engineering in order to wreak their revenge? Um, are they able or willing to sign your local AUP about what your guest network can be used for? And how much pain are you going to have to go through to configure their device. And that's before you even get to the point of letting them on your network. Um, I've been to places where they've, you find the help desk eventually and it turns out to be in a different building to the one you've actually arrived at. And you go there and they say, oh, please take a seat where, while we get the person you're visiting to come from their office and sign a piece of paper to say that we can give you this scratch card with a password on it. And the one that they rarely ask, and they probably should be asking, is how long I'm going to be there. Is this a three-day visit? Should that account be left running for three days? Am I just there for the hour, and should it be deleted almost straight away? What attack surface is left by unattended guest accounts? Because you can't quite assume that the guest has gone. So there's all these overheads. I've been challenged for identifying information. I've had support desk staff 
phone a number back of back at my organization, a number that they asked me to give them, so I'm not sure <laughs> how secure that was. I've, I've signed pieces of paper in the usual end user way of scanning in a few seconds something that would take one of our lawyers a week to review. Um, not so much lately, but in the past I've been traveling with a device to which I did not have root access and couldn't install a, a network profile. So I was sunk at that point. I couldn't get on the guest network. I've been signed in. I've been given temporary credentials out of a printer, out of a pre-created box of scratch cards via an iPad, sort of bolted to a bit of tubing so that it looks like a terminal station. Um, who knows how much of my personal information I've given away to each of these places I've visited trying to get my job done in terms of contact details and phone numbers and who I have sort of working relationships and what the registration number is of my car and so on and so on. But why am I giving that away piecemeal in an interaction with someone at a help desk sometimes? JISC, back at my home base, they know who I am. They can identify me. Um, they can tell them whether I'm a good chap or not and whether I'm likely to hack this guest network I'm visiting. Um, they also have a big hammer to squish me with if I do misbehave. They employ me. They pay my mortgage. They can use that to make me go back and apologize if I do something bad at the site I'm visiting. And they're the ones that gave me most of the devices I use. They control corporately the build of some of those. So I finally get to the topic of the talk, federated roaming. And it's quite a simple concept. In normal guest networks, the place that's being visited takes on authentication from whatever information they can garner. And they then give access to a presumably well-configured wireless LAN. And working with people like yourselves, they get that well-configured wireless LAN. But the weak point is that authentication step or the sort of soft skills checks they make before they give a credential to that person that will authenticate. So in federated roaming, we decouple that. We say, your employer, your home base, has the answers to all those questions so they can make the authentication decision. We'll just grant access to the network and run a guest wireless LAN as well as we know how. And part of how we'll configure it is a way to allow the home base to do the authentication decision because they hold all the cards. And the way that the visited organization and that home organization work together and trust each other is kind of a policy thing. It's what terms they've signed up to. We call that fabric of trust. So I've kind of come in under a false flag. Federated roaming is not a wireless technology. It's a trust agreement. The actual technologies we're deploying are Stone Age dial-up networking stuff. But it works beautifully. How does it work? Well, you need some minimums at the organization that wants to join this fabric of trust. You need information on your staff. You need a RADIUS server. That's the Stone Age technology I was referring to, RADIUS. And you need some sort of network to share. If you've got those three, you don't need any capital expenditure to join a federated trust network like EdgeRoam or GovRoam or any others that are out there. This is the clever bit of the slides. So I hope you've been anticipating this. Look at that. <laughs> so if there's two such organizations, and if there's a party in between that's willing to proxy radius authentication transactions, then our, our blonde worker can migrate from blue to red, connect to their guest network, and let's see if this has magical laser pointer power. They then attempt to authenticate to this network. The local radius says, I don't recognize you as local. I don't know who you are. Anyone I don't recognize, I just punt up to JISC. And JISC says, oh, we recognize who that person is, not from their identity. It's an anonymous transaction tunneled in 802.1x. 
but there's a realm element in the username. So what we see at the top here is anonymous at camford.ac.uk or whatever realm. And we say, we recognize that realm, we'll send it there. And their radius recognizes it and authenticates it. And the authentication decision comes back to the visited site and they get onto the guest network. Simple, using basic core features of radius. There's, there's no brain surgery here. The only reason I left this slide in from the aborted first version, and apologies to whoever I stole this swim line on, lane on from the web, is, is this part of it. When it's an EPTLS transaction, it's the network validating the client and the val client validating the network. There's actually heavy duty security and heavy duty encryption built in to this federated authentication that's being proxied across public internet. You can't get at the payload, it's AES encrypted, so those highly valuable credentials are secure. You can't really break into the transaction between the radius server at the home organization and the radius server that's managing the guest network at the visited organization, because that is a tunnel transaction using shared secrets. So what would this do for you if you could get it working? For the user, it's brilliant. You're getting out of the car in the car park at the hospital trust or the GP surgery or the local government office or the National Park Ranger Station, and your phone is already connected to the federated network that you're wanting to join. I've lost count of the number of times I've had the experience of traveling to a meeting this year, one at Umia in Sweden. So my body clock was all messed up. It was pitch black. It was, um, I wasn't sleeping, so I got to the venue really early, so a quarter to eight in the morning. It happened to be unlocked, but there were no staff there at all. But I went in, got myself a coffee, sat down and answered 20 emails before other people started arriving. And I didn't realize what I hadn't had to do. I hadn't had to go and find a help desk. I hadn't signed any forms, signing my life away. I hadn't asked permission to use this network because Umia and GIS, both part of this fabric of trust, they were donating their guest network to the commons, just as GIS donates its guest networks to the commons, and we could, by agreement, use each other's network without any of those intervening steps. So from my point of view, and uh, I'll forgive you for stealing my thunder, it's just like water out of a tap or light when you flick a switch. That's what Wi-Fi should be like. It should get out of the way of you doing work. And it should be, you should surprise yourself if you ever actually, as a user, have to think about what's happening to make that email go or to show you that web page. Let Wi-Fi be the magic that we all thought it was originally when it first came out in the sort of 802.11b days. So you don't have to prove who you are. You don't have to reconfigure your device because your home organization runs this same system, and you set it up with your home organization support team when it was first issued to you, or when you first joined the company. And the best bit is you'll run into islands of connectivity using these international federated roaming mechanisms when you least expect it. And quite a lot of hotels and quite a lot of restaurants and various places you find yourself, you might suddenly hear your phone updating its email because that profile's on your device. It sees Edurome or it sees Govrome and it starts sucking in data for free at high bandwidth on a known network design that your organization has said it trusts. It's a great experience. So for that home organization, they get that high quality network. Wherever they go that participates in this scheme, they know that they can do email, they can check the web, and for everything else, they can launch a secure VPN back to their home. The home organization is responsible for the authentication, so it has all of those records. It can control that. If I've gone on a rampage of visiting conferences and just decides to rein me in, they can stop letting me join these networks just by twiddling something on the home base radius server. And it's free at point of use for the user. 
In the edge of your own world, all of it's free. In the GovRoam world, we charge an organizational subscription just to keep the lights on. For the visited organization, you might still have a help desk, but you don't need one, and you don't need absolutely everybody to visit it before you can offer them networking services. You don't absolutely need a temporary account mechanism, although not everyone comes from a sector that has federated roaming in place yet. Um, you and your staff get access to this vast roaming network, as well as entertaining the guests coming to you in the most convenient way possible. And in the nicest possible way, you know virtually nothing about the visitors that you connect. You know that they have come from an organization that has signed up to the rules of EdgeRome or GovRome, for example. But you don't know who they are. <coughs> you don't know what their job role is. So you have no duties under GDPR to, <coughs> no, I do apologize, to log that information. But if you ever need to, <coughs> oh, I told you this would happen. If the police ever come to your door and say, who had this IP address on this door because they've been a naughty person? <coughs> You can't answer that question on your own, but the policies you signed up to, you can, through JISC, get in touch with the home organization and say, we've got a DHCP log that ties an IP address to a radius session. You have an authentication log that ties a radius session to a personal identity of someone that in policy space, by allowing them to authenticate on, let's say, GovRome, you have vouched for and asserted that you will help resolve these sorts of incidents and use the contractual power you have over that person to make things right. Resolve those two things and you have a fully identified solution and you can satisfy the police and not suffer reputation damage and so on and so on. <coughs> So we actually get to talking about an example of this network. You can see this wonderful sp spaghetti diagram, which is a bit gray on that screen. Um, I'd like to say that this is a picture of roaming transactions across a month in the UK today. This is a picture of one day of roaming transactions in 2002. It isn't worth updating this diagram because you just get a flat block of color. At least here you can see some curves and the idea that people are moving from place to place. Edge of Rome, I don't know how many people are aware of it, but it is um, deployed across 101 countries, fully deployed in education, 18 are in pilot stages. This whole experience of arriving in a car park at Umeå University in Sweden in the dark it's that zero-touch user experience. It grants that to all of these members. No one, I think, quite knows how many members there are across all of these nations. My estimate of current live um, Edgerome credentials would be knocking on 100 million out there somewhere across the world. I've talked about the GDPR solution. And I've talked about how it, you don't have to buy new stuff to do this. It's just whatever you'd already would have had for a, let's call it an old fashioned local guest solution, the radius server, the network, some sort of repository of identity. <coughs> now we get to some fun numbers. I haven't had my team repeat this calculation lately, so we're going back to March. But uh, we have this metric of roaming days, so every time <coughs> we see a unique device at least once, that's a roaming day, when we see it away from its home organization, I mean. So our built-in assumption is that if we've seen that device, it means the person who owns it has traveled somewhere and is doing some useful work associated with their job. Big assumption in the education world, but let's run with it. Um, 11 million roaming days in one month. 
50,000 person years. If only 1% of that is a real piece of research being facilitated <coughs> or meetings happening or so on, it's a huge productivity boost for UK education. If we assume that instead of using Edgerome, they'd arrived at that site and sprinted from their car and spent five minutes finding the help desk, signing the forms, persuading them to let you on, reconfiguring their device, and that five minute of their time and the five minutes of the help desk person assisting them, just add those five minutes up if it's a member of staff whose job is roaming and they're doing this a couple of times a week. It's a thousand staff equivalent of time in the year. If we went to the organisation of UK universities and said, spread out however you like across your membership, we'll, we'll fund a thousand members of staff, what could you do with that? I don't know what their answer would be, but I'm sure they'd fall off their chairs when we first made the offer. But we've already given it to them with Edgerone. It's just not surfaced very well and recognised. And we're seeing about 1.6 million unique devices per month in a busy period, quieter in the summer and so on. Another example. Oh dear, I've used the wrong slide there with that winner's badge on there. Uh, best communication system um, for, for healthcare. Um, that's a recent award that I couldn't resist boasting about. Um, GovRome is, we've stolen all the ideas that were publicly funded in development for EduRome 15 years ago, and we've just scribbled out EDU and written in Gov in crayon, rebadged the whole thing, and we're selling it to the wider public sector. Sold on a at cost basis. It's paid my train fare here, not much else. <laughs> we could have taken 15 years of technology advancement and built GovRome as an entirely new roaming solution, but it seemed to me to have more value to say EduRome was the 15-year proof of concept trial of the technology for GovRome. It's absolutely guaranteed it will work. Um, our stakeholders seem to have believed that sort of spiel because starting as a test in 2016 and going properly live in, uh, I think, July 2017, uh, we've now just gone past 4,500 public buildings in the UK. By organisation, that's 42% NHS. I think by building, it's something like 46% NHS. From the smallest GP surgery to mega hospitals like Jimmy and Jimmy's and so on. Um, so GovRome is out there duplicating the story of Edgerome and delivering those same benefits on a wider scale to different aspects of, of UK PLC. The way we've structured GovRome is we've put another layer in the proxying hierarchy so we don't have direct visibility of all the roaming that goes on because about 80% of the roaming happens between close neighbours and we've structured the hierarchy so that that traffic never reaches the very top national level so we don't see it. So we, I can't give you the same sort of fantastic gosh numbers um, but it's a heavily used network and it's actually delivering real benefits out in the world and I'll just highlight one of those which is the Kent Public Service Network They've bought into GovRome in a big way. Um, they actually uh, built a parallel infrastructure to do all of the authentication, and I think separate wireless controllers in some cases. But as you can see from the list there, they've really invested across the entire public sector in getting this rolled out. Um, in many of the appropriate cases, they've put out EduRome at the same time. We've had the discussion about, do we merge GovRome and EduRome and have a single public network? But for some reason, the local governments and the NHS trusts of the world have a deep fear of their public reception areas filling up with students draped over the couches and watching kitten videos. Um, <laughs> the governance is very different. It's a, it's a different approach and a different need. So they are separate networks at the moment. One day, dare I say, when public sector roaming has matured a bit as a community, and they're starting to expect it the way that education does. Um, 
we can just uncomment a few lines of code somewhere and they're identical under the hood and we can merge these networks. The fun application I wanted to highlight that Kent have recently won awards for and so on um, is captured by this obscure term Brexit. Um, what this distills to is Kent is expecting to turn into a car park at some point when Brexit is first introduced. Uh, with all of the ports locking up and all of the lorries building up. But because they have GovRome in all of their public buildings, their response plan for this just say, says, get wherever you can get to locally. As long as you can find a corner to sit down, you will be on a network that connects you to all the systems you need to do, use. Just get the job done. Don't struggle for the, through the traffic to get to the right council office that you want to work in. So a key part of their Brexit response plan is having deployed GovRome and having that flexibility on their network, the ability for any of their staff to work out of any of their estate, including sitting in the corner in a fire station or wherever it might be. And there's lots of other applications there that I won't go through in any detail. So we get to the point of my take-home message for you. Um, federating the approach, if you're in that sort of group of related organisations and industry sector, and if they're willing to trust each other, it really delivers on supporting roaming. And once you've got a trusted, easy-to-access roaming capability, the way you work transforms different speeds, but as people get used to it. Um, I think one of the earlier talks mentioned the possibility of getting people into the same room to have a meeting instead of all working from their separate organisations because it's so hard to connect people under whatever COCO rules are in place. We've been hearing anecdotes in the public sector, and I will keep this as vague as possible to spare people's blushes, that multidisciplinary meetings are scheduled to take place in the coffee shop down the street because it's so hard to get everyone pre-configured to attend that meeting and sit around the nice mahogany table they've got, that they just go to the coffee shop and, and buy a coffee and get a free Wi-Fi password. So some of the planning of our public services is happening in cafe networks because doing guest networks secure, securely locally presents such a hop, an obstacle that they compromise their security and go to this wild and woolly in Ethernet, internet, wireless, um, as being preferable. So GovRome solves that problem for them. Um, the other thing is, whatever guest network they already have, they almost certainly have all the building blocks. So it's almost zero cost to add GovRome in on top of this or EduRome in on top of this for the appropriate sectors. So if you're responding to a bid for someone who wants a wireless LAN with guest capabilities, throw these federated services in on top as well if it's appropriate to do so. They don't cost a lot to deploy. They will transform the way your customers work. And we're saving money for the public sector. I've used star.roam there to cover GovRome and EduRome. I don't think if such a thing had happened that it would be appropriate for me to discuss meetings in DCMS about something called Citizen Rome. Um, or any of the other Rome alternatives, but this is simple technology. It's really easy to port to other use cases. I'd encourage you to steal from all the lessons we've learned and build an equivalent for the commercial world or for, I don't know, defense industry. We'll advise, we'll share whatever we have if anyone wants to go down that route. So that's me. I, I know I'm not a core part of the wireless industry. I hope some of that was interesting to you. Um, and do enjoy your lunch. <laughs>